E Indian Lake, WXLQ, Bristol, Vermont, WXLJ, Whitehall, Glens Falls. It's 8 o'clock. Good morning. This is Northern Light for Monday, April 15th. I'm Monica Sandresky. And I'm Todd Moe. Jefferson and St. Lawrence counties recently increased the amount they reimburse funeral homes when they bury people who can't afford to pay, but it doesn't help struggling families who don't qualify. The ones that don't are generally like right on the edge. Honestly, I feel badly for them because they're truly the working poor. Once you get past this limit of income, there's no assistance. Lawmakers are two weeks late on hashing out a spending plan for the state for the next year, and there's no resolution in sight. And NCPR book reviewer Betsy Capus shares her thoughts about Canadian writer Amanda Peters' debut novel, The Berry Pickers. I won't say it's a happy book, but Norma and Joe do find some happiness as they age, and at the end of the book... Yes, what happens? There is a twist I didn't expect, and I'm not going to tell you any more than that. All that's coming up on Northern Light. Stick with us. Broadcast of Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio is supported by Adirondack Experience, the museum on Blue Mountain Lake, exploring people's connection to the Adirondacks with interactive exhibits and culturally rich collections, reopening May 24th, the adkx.org. And by Apothecary Chocolates, making gourmet chocolates by hand from all natural herbs, botanicals, and tree syrups, apothecarychocolates.com. And we're celebrating public radio this week. It's our spring fundraiser here at North Country Public Radio. And joining me right now is station manager Mitch Tyke. Hey, Mitch. Hey there, Todd Moe. And uh, hey, everybody. Good Monday morning to you all. And, you know, when you think about it, every time Todd or Monica or any of our on-air personalities says support for NCPR comes from, you can fill in your name as well, because this is a listener-supported service. This is everything that you hear on North Country Public Radio, or you access online, or you attend in person. It's all made possible by you. That's the way it's worked for 56 years, and that's the way it will always work. We are not just for the North Country. We are of the North Country. So take just a moment now and support Northern Light, support Morning Edition, support all the events that we do in person, support everything you depend on at ncpr.org by going to ncpr.org slash give or taking just a moment and talking to a really friendly voice on a Monday morning. We won't be overly perky. We'll be just the perfect person to talk to on a Monday morning, 877 877- Three eight eight six two seven seven. Maybe you want perky, so we, we can we can be perky if you need it. Uh, but uh, but take just a moment and call eight seven seven three eight eight six two seven seven. And when you make that contribution right now, you will be entered to win a sixty four gigabyte Kindle Scribe. It's a it's an electronic reader, but it's a very friendly electronic reader. It's a one of those paper white displays. It's glare free. It's a 10.2 inches and uh, 300 points per inch, if that's uh, something that excites you. Um, but it's uh, it feels very much like a real live paper book, but it's uh, easy if you maybe you've got a vacation coming up sometime this summer or you're going to go out to your uh, your camp. And you don't want to bring 10 books with you, but you can bring them on this thing uh, and you're entered to win it when you make your contribution now. 877-388-6277 or ncpr.org slash give. We've got lots more to talk about, but first we need to hear from Todd and Monica and everything you depend on on Northern Light. This is Northern Light. I'm Monica Sandresky. And I'm Todd Moe. 
A health center is slated to open soon in the space formerly occupied by Lake Placid's emergency room. The facility was closed by Adirondack Health last year. This summer, the Hudson Headwaters Health Network will open a primary care practice there. It'll include family medicine, women's health, and behavioral health services. The Adirondack Daily Enterprise reports that town officials have celebrated the new health center and called it greatly needed. In recent years, Lake Placid lost both its ER and an urgent care on Saranac Avenue. The new health center will not operate as either. It will accept same-day appointments for acute needs, including coughs, ear infection, and minor injuries. Hudson Headwaters runs 23 health centers across the North Country. It focuses its work on underserved communities and accepts Medicaid insurance. The Thousand Islands Land Trust has gone to court to halt work on a Carlton Island campground project. According to the Watertown Daily Times, the Land Trust filed an official motion against Ronald Clapp last week. Clapp purchased Carlton Villa and its property in 2022 with plans to build 12 cabins for camping and glamping around the villa. The Thousand Islands Land Trust holds a conservation easement on Carlton Island. It says that Clapp's project violates several provisions of the easement. After Clapp brought heavy machinery onto the island last week, the land trust filed an injunction. If granted, Clapp would have to halt all work while the case proceeds. Ogdensburg Child, Ogdensburg's Child Care Center is moving forward with engineering plans. The Ogdensburg Bridge and Port Authority has been working on constructing a new center in its Commerce Park for several years now. The center will have 125 child care slots and be run by the ARC Jefferson St. Lawrence. The OBPA recently confirmed an engineering deal and officials say construction should begin in early 2025. When it opens, it will drastically increase the availability of child care in Ogdensburg and its surrounding communities. The DEC is considering a permitting system for bass fishing tournaments in New York. It would collect data and make tournaments more official. Amy Feierisel has more. DEC Commissioner Basil Sago says the goal of the proposed permitting system would be to help the state better manage its fisheries by requiring a free permit for bass tournaments and launching a reporting system to identify where and when black bass tournaments are happening. He says collecting that data would help the DEC address the overuse of certain fisheries and would also be shared with fisheries biologists. New York is a major destination for bass fishing tournaments, and the North Country hosts dozens of them each year, from Ticonderoga to Ogdensburg, Platt to Waddington. The DEC's plan would require permits for tournaments starting this coming January. It would also give the DEC the power to implement conditions on tournaments. Right now, the permit system is just a proposal, and the DEC is taking public comment on it until June 10th. Amy Feierisel, North Country Public Radio. You can find more information about how to comment on the proposed permitting system at ncpr.org. The cost of a funeral can overwhelm a family. In the North Country, almost one in five families lives below the federal poverty line, and some people don't have the money to bury loved ones when they die. Funeral homes do those burials anyway with partial reimbursements from the government. This month, St. Lawrence County agreed to increase those reimbursements. That'll be good for funeral homes, but it won't help the families who struggle to pay for burial and cremation. Lucy Grindon reports. When a loved one dies, a simple funeral can easily cost $10,000. Even the most basic burial with no funeral is about $5,000. Cremation is $3,000. Paul Mackay is the director of the funeral home in downtown Canton. He says some people simply can't afford that. Oftentimes it's like, here's, here's the deal. We don't have any money and I don't, I don't believe mom has any either. What can, what, you know, what do we do? So then that's when the funeral home says, well, we could apply to the county to see if they would help us. The county reimburses funeral homes for what are called indigent burials for people who are extremely poor. But very few burials are eligible. The county's paid for just 129 of them per year on average over the past five years. Plenty of people here can't take on a $5,000 burial expense, but lots of those people don't qualify for help. The ones that don't are generally like right on the edge. And honestly, I feel badly for them because they're truly the working poor. They, 
it's cut and dry. It's like once you get past this limit of income, there's no assistance. In order to qualify, the deceased person's legally responsible relatives, that's spouses and parents, have to have less than $1,500 in available resources. That means they could be living on Social Security and SNAP benefits with very little in savings. But if they have a house or a life insurance policy, they're unlikely to qualify. And according to Mackay, the Canton funeral director, costs have gotten even higher over the past few years with inflation. The price of a casket alone has increased by about $300. Everything in our business has gone up just as much as anybody else's has. Last December, Jefferson County upped its indigent burial reimbursements. Then St. Lawrence County reached out to its local funeral directors association. Mackay is the association's president. The county came to us and said, hey, we know the other counties are doing this. Would you be interested in speaking with us? We understand that you guys are due for an increase. And I were like, yeah, <laughs> you know, absolutely. For the past decade, the county's been paying about $1,800 for each indigent burial. The state's been adding another 900 Altogether, funeral homes have only been getting back about half of what it actually costs them to do the burials. Earlier this month, the St. Lawrence County Board of Legislators adopted a resolution to raise reimbursements by about $1,000. Mackay says the increase will be helpful for funeral homes, but it won't do anything for the families struggling with rising funeral costs who don't qualify for indigent burial. Lucy Grindon, North Country Public Radio. You're listening to Northern Light right here on NCPR. It's about 10 after 8. Good morning. I'm Monica Sandreski here with our general manager, Mitch Tyke. I mean, important reporting from Lucy, right? Uh, absolutely, Monica. And in fact, uh, the kinds of stories that you really only hear on North Country Public Radio, uh, Lucy does an amazing job finding stories like that. In fact, all the members of our NCPR news team, uh, they're, they're just incredible at what they do. And it's... Um, Maybe it should go without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. We are incredibly lucky to have such a dedicated, such a hardworking news team uh, doing you know, just incredible work on behalf of the North Country and sharing our story with the world as well. The number of stories by uh, NCPR news reporters, whether it's Emily Russell or Lucy Grindon or you, Monica Sandresky, or anybody on the NCPR news team that uh, go out on the national airwaves it's a it's it's a tribute both to the incredible work that you're able to do but it's also a tribute to the great support we've had over the 56 years that ncpr has been telling the stories of the north country take just a moment now support reporting that you can only hear on north country public radio call 877-388-6277 or go to ncpr.org slash give we have eighty six thousand dollars left to raise now is the time to make your donation. Join with Louise Gava in Saranac Lake, Susan and Alec Friedman in Lake Placid, and Nancy both in Keene, who said thanks for all the ways NCPR connects the people of the North Country. Thank you. You be next. Call 877-388-6277 or go to ncpr.org slash give. Thank you so much. Listening to Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio. It's 814. Good morning. I'm Todd Moe. And I'm Monica Sandreski. Coming up, Betsy Capis reviews The Berry Pickers, a profoundly moving novel told from the alternating point of view of two siblings. That conversation in just a few minutes here on Northern Light. by Alan Dunham in South Glens Falls. 
Listeners in South Glens Falls, how about a gift in support of Alan Dunham and all the regional musicians you hear on this station? Let's hear it for regional musicians with a gift. ncpr.org slash give or call us 877-388-6277. Northern Light is supported by the Village Mercantile in Saranac Lake, established in 2011 with a mission of community-fueled solutions with products for home, camp, and gift-giving. VillageMerc.com, anything but general. The New York State budget is now two weeks late. Lawmakers are due back this afternoon to pass a fourth extender to keep the government running. As Karen DeWitt reports, there's no resolution in sight. Republicans who are in the minority party in state government criticize Democrats, including Governor Kathy Hochul and the leaders of the legislature, for failing to come to an accord on a spending plan that was due back on April 1st. Senator Tom O'Mara, the ranking GOP member on the Senate Finance Committee, spoke on the Senate floor as another budget extender was approved. And we should be working far more diligently to get this job done rather than just extending the budget deadline. Issues that are dividing Hochul and the Democrats in the legislature include a housing package, how to distribute school aid, and how much to spend on Medicaid, including whether to make changes to a popular home health care program. Hochul and the Democratic leaders have said little publicly about exactly what divides them or the status of negotiations. Assembly Minority Leader William Barclay decried the lack of transparency. He says in earlier days, the Albany adage was three men in a room. That described the private meetings held between governors and the two majority party legislative leaders. Now, he says, there are two women and one man, but the dynamic has not changed. It used to be always three men in a room. Uh, you know, they're making backroom doors. It wasn't helpful to New Yorkers. Don't hear much about that now. There's three Dems in the room. Senator Jim Tedisco, also a Republican, made an analogy to the recent total solar eclipse. He says his constituents don't like the secrecy, and they don't like it when lawmakers don't meet their deadlines. He said it would take 24 years to have the second eclipse. I never thought we'd see the second eclipse so soon, because it's happening right here on the New York State budget right now. Total darkness. Senate Finance Committee Chair Liz Krueger, who is part of the Democratic majority, admits there is frustration over the budget delays. But she says her constituents would rather have a good budget that's slightly late than an on-time spending plan that doesn't address some key issues. As long as we are paying our bills, we are assuring people that the government of New York State continues to operate. There is no interference in any issue or work that needs to be done. I actually think our constituents probably are talking to us about specific issues in the budget that they hope are in in the final budget or hope are not are or they hope are not in. And I think that's exactly what we are trying to do. Kruger says a budget agreement might be reached next week before the Passover holiday begins on April 22nd. But she concedes it might not be. In Albany, I'm Karen DeWitt for the New York Public News Network. Lots of North Country towns have one big thing that transformed them. A paper mill, a mine, a factory. In Glens Falls, it was a canal. Anna Williams-Bergen has this North Country at Work story. Glens Falls sits nestled along the Hudson River, just outside the southern border of the Adirondack Park. If you were living there in the 1800s and thinking about business opportunities, it's a pretty perfect location. Close to lots of natural resources with a waterway that can take them down to Albany or New York. Maureen Folk is a curator at the Chapman Museum in Glens Falls. It was settled because of the presence of the Hudson River. They knew that water power would be valuable. And so it was always intended to have mills along the river. In the 1820s, New York was building massive canal projects. The Erie Canal is the most famous. But there was also the Champlain Canal, connecting southern Lake Champlain to the Hudson River. Folks says those projects gave business leaders in Glens Falls an idea. Once those canals started to be built, Erie Canal 
Champlain Canal, the industrialists in Glens Falls and the people really invested in those industries were like, we want a piece of this pie. Enter the Glens Falls Feeder Canal, which finished construction in 1829. The canal was narrow, short, and only about four to six feet deep. But folks says local leaders knew it had lots of potential, if it could be widened to allow shipping. Its original purpose is to send water from the Hudson River over to the Champlain Canal so that the Champlain Canal can can better function and and have a higher water. But then it was so needed by locals that they began to use it for industry, and uh, that completely revolutionized Lens Falls. In 1932, they widened the canal to let two barges pass side by side. The feeder canal could now move materials from Glens Falls and the Adirondacks downstate. Lumber, black marble, lime, all of those things were shipped on the feeder canal, connecting over to the Champlain Canal and connecting down to New York City. It put Glens Falls on a nationwide market. Logs from across the Adirondacks floated down the Hudson River to Glens Falls, where workers turned them into boards and later paper. Black marble and lime were quarried, processed, and sent down the canal. Folk says it transformed the town. In 1831, there's about 100 people living in Glens Falls. The canal is finished in 1832. By 1890, I know that that's a jump by about 50, 60 years, but we're up to about 10,000 people. With those people came money. As local industry grew, so did the wealth of people at the top. Folk says industry leaders invested heavily in the community, building an opera house and a theater. And so Glens Falls is built up as a result of not only these industries, but the amount of money that was put back into the community. We have parks, we have trailways, we have all these different things because there was, I think, a strong effort from the very beginning to keep the community in mind. The feeder canal is only seven miles long, but it had a huge impact on Glens Falls. So it's like this seven miles changed the functionality of this entire city. Nowadays, the canal isn't the economic powerhouse that it used to be, but folks says you can still see its economic legacy all over Glens Falls. For North Country Public Radio's North Country at Work project, I'm Anna Williams-Bergen. North Country at Work is a long-running project of NCPR that collects photos and stories about working life in our region. And if you have a work story you'd like to share, email us, work at ncpr.org. I'm Monica Sandreski here to step in for just a moment to, that, to remind you that this is our spring fundraiser. Northern Light shows that this is a full community of ideas that you hear every morning from from Lucy's Hard News reporting on indigent burials to to Anna's story about the the history of such an important community uh, in in our region, Glens Falls. This is all locally sourced. It is from right here. Everyone on, that you hear on the radio lives here in our community, reporting on the issues and the stories that matter to you. If you've been listening day after day and morning after morning, you know that this is a special thing. It matters that you support it. Give now online at ncpr.org slash give or call 877-388-6277. And thank you so much for your support. Listening to Northern Lights here on North Country Public Radio. I'm Todd Moe. And I'm Monica Sandreski. In just a minute, a review of Amanda Peters' debut novel, The Berry Pickers, the winner of this year's Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction. Then stick around after the show for Bird Note coming up at 842. First, Todd has a look at the weather for us. Weather service says partly to mostly cloudy skies and scattered showers today. Highs mid to upper 50s. 
winds out of the west, occasional gusts up to 30, 40 miles per hour at times. Tonight, lows dipping into the 30s with maybe an isolated shower. And then tomorrow, sunshine, highs mid-50s, light winds out of the west, southwest, partly cloudy Wednesday, and a slight chance of some rain again on Thursday and Friday. Right now in Canton, cloudy skies and 44 degrees. Maine is well known as a state that produces blueberries, but who picks them? In Amanda Peters' debut novel, uh, a Mi'kmaq family from Nova Scotia makes the trip south every summer to the blueberry fields. When their four-year-old daughter disappears, the tragedy disturbs many lives. Our book reviewer Betsy Capus talked with me about the novel The Berry Pickers. Todd, I looked up the history of the Mi'kmaq people. They are a First Nation people who live in the Canadian Maritimes, and they're related to the Abenaki people of northern New England. Hmm. In this novel, which begins in 1962, the people are picking blueberries in Maine, and it's an important part of the yearly income for the Mi'kmaq families from the Maritimes. It's during a day of picking that four-year-old Ruthie disappears. So does she wander off? That's what everyone thinks at first, but they search and search and they can't find her. It is devastating to the family. There are a few clues. The white man who owns the blueberry farm has remarked that she had lighter skin than many of the other pickers, so he seems a likely candidate to have taken her away. Why would he do that? Well, the book moves forward in time, and one of the narrators is a dark-haired girl named Norma. She lives in a nice house in Augusta, Maine with her older white parents. Her mother keeps her close and won't let her go anywhere alone. And Norma has dreams that her mother dismisses about people she used to know and places she remembers. Right. Uh Aha. Yeah. Yeah. One of the great things about a novel to me is that the reader can know more than the characters do. Norma has no idea that she used to be a Mi'kmaq girl named Ruthie. And the other narrator of the book, Joe, has no idea that his little sister, Ruthie, is still alive. As a reader, of course, I wanted them to find each other. But Norma's new family keeps the secret, even when Norma has grown up. Wait, so during the entire book, Norma never finds out she was kidnapped as a child? I'm not going to give anything away, Todd. But it's that suspense that keeps the story moving. When will someone figure out who Ruthie slash Norma really is? Mm. Um, As a newlywed, Norma has a miscarriage, and she grieves deeply. So her grief marries the grief of her Mi'kmaq mother. Here's Norma. I found it strange that no word exists for a parent who loses a child. If children lose their parents, they are orphans. If a husband loses his wife, he's a widower. But there's no word for a parent who loses a child. I've come to believe that the event is just too big, too monstrous, Too overwhelming for words. No word could ever describe the feeling. So we'd leave it unsaid. Mm. Wow. I mean, this sounds like such a a sad book. So much loss. There is a lot of sadness. I mean, you know, a disappearing child. Um, Joe, Ruthie's older brother, and he's only six when she's taken, Mm. never recovers from the loss of his sister. He wanders around Canada finding seasonal work and drinking too much after he's ruined a good marriage. A man he works for in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, says to him, A young man showing up this far away from home. Something's making you all dark and moody. Joe answers, I lost my sister when I was six. I let my brother die when I was 15. And I left my wife bloody and bruised two weeks ago. That's my story. Well, you know... I'm not sure I could read such a sad book. Well, I got to say, it, it's an e- I'm not say easy book to read. It's, yeah. It flows, right? It's not slow. And there's always the hope of a happy ending, uh-huh. right, until you get there. Uh, Norma and Joe do grow as they age and as they try to understand the trauma in their lives. Norma loves going to a lake cabin her family owns in interior Maine. Here she is, driving north. I like the wildness in this part of Maine. The trees decaying into bogs, the color of the berry fields as you drive past. There's also a sadness, abandoned houses, scorched fields in fall, a solitary and untamed landscape with rare flashes of color. 
Well, and even there, her description, trees decaying into bogs, abandoned houses, scorched fields. I mean, those even those descriptions are sad. Yeah, I mean, it's not a happy place. Yeah. I won't say it's a happy book. Yeah. Um, but Norma and Joe do find some happiness as they age. And at the end of the book... Yes, what happens? There is a twist I didn't expect, and I'm not going to tell you any okay. more than that. I think this novel did really well in imagining how trauma goes so deep into us, even when we're young children. Mm. I admired Norma and Joe for doing their best to heal in ways that worked for them. Okay. Well, as always, thank you for your thoughts, Betsy. Anytime. I always enjoy talking about books. Our book reviewer, Betsy Capis, lives, reads.